is a pleasure having uh, Dr. William Lane Craig with us for this interview. Uh, welcome. Thank you. It's good to be with you, John. So uh, you've been to plenty of these uh, Q and A, uh, haven't you? What do you feel about uh, participating in, in these kind of events? Well, the social media has been a great boon to my ministry during the pandemic. I have quit traveling and speaking in person. But through the social media, I am able to reach thousands and thousands of people with the defense and proclamation of the gospel far more than I would have been able to touch through my own personal contacts. Well, that's that's wonderful that we can exploit this uh, digital era, reaching out to people uh, all over the world at the same at the same time, and now also Norway as well. Exactly. So we're doing this Q&A associated with the launch of your book On Guard for students being translated into Norwegian, uh, which will be uh, due to uh, be uh, in sale in Norwegian stores in, in June, uh, which we look forward to. We just sent it into the print. So we, we look forward to uh, being able to uh, reach out with good material also in Norwegian. Uh, but before we do that, I, I was just uh, keen to ask you on, because I know that you're working on a uh, philosophical systematic theology. Yes. Uh, isn't that correct? Yeah. Where you explore different uh, topics concerning the Christian faith. You've been exploring the historical Adam and Eve, something like that. What, what are you currently exploring in, in that project? I am currently working on the doctrine of the Trinity and more specifically, I'm looking at the biblical basis for the doctrine of the Trinity. I think that it can be shown that the New Testament teaches that there is one God, but that there are three distinct persons who are properly called God. And that forms the foundation, I think, for a doctrine of the Trinity uh, that God is an immaterial, tripersonal being. That's very interesting. Difficult topic, though, the, the Trinity uh, has been an uh, object for much criticism throughout the, the years. Yes, and to be honest, John, I think that most of the criticism is of the creedal and later church um, formulations of the doctrine rather than the biblical doctrine that I just mentioned a moment ago. It seems to me that the doctrine, the biblical doctrine, that there is an immaterial, spiritual, tri-personal being is philosophically unproblematic. I, I don't see any difficulty with that. It's only when you get into these deep philosophical um articulations of the doctrine that you begin to run into difficulties. Brilliant. Well, we look forward to that as well. We've got plenty of things to look forward to. Um, let me let me dive into the question, if, if it's okay with, with you. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the first question is, I thought of it as perhaps an easy question, but perhaps it is a, a more hard question that, that people would imagine. And the question is, are there any topics that you find more thrilling to teach than other for instance, the resurrection or the Kalam or something else, well, which is your favorite. It's very funny, John, but it seems that whatever topic I happen to be working on is the one that I'm most excited and passionate about. And when I move to a new topic, I kind of lose interest in the old topic. And now I, I, I'm so excited about the new one. And I, I find it hard to believe that I could have let go of that former topic that I once was so enamored with uh, because of now this new love. But I would say that of all of the topics I've worked on, probably the doctrine of Christ's substitutionary atonement would be the most thrilling. It seems to me that this is a doctrine which lies at the very heart of the Christian faith and which involves a whole host of interesting philosophical questions that need to be explored. Well, yeah, that is a good answer. I mean, uh, it is central of our faith, and uh, to explore that is, is very thrilling. But I would say that of all the topics that I've worked on over the years, the one that I find the most thrilling would be the doctrine of Christ's substitutionary atonement. 
This doctrine lies at the very heart of the Christian faith, and it is just filled with interesting philosophical ramifications. And so that has been, I think, one of the most rewarding studies that I've ever done, the doctrine of the atonement. That, that's very interesting. I, I remember reading your Atonement and the Death of Christ while in a seminary, a theological seminary, and I remember that my professor, he uh, used to critique uh, the substitutional, penal substitutionary atonement. Oh. And I was reading your book and, uh, while, while doing the seminary, and, and it really helped me through it. Good, good. Yeah. Okay, so, so the next question that came in is also on a more, per, uh, on a more personal note, uh, and um, it is, do you have a daily routine for nursing your personal relationship with God? For example, praying, Bible reading, listening to worship music. Mm -hmm. what, what does a day uh, look like uh, connected to Bible reading and stuff like that? I do think that it's important to maintain a personal devotional life, and so every weekday, I wake up in the morning and have a time of prayer, uh, and typically I have Bible uh, study. I'll, I'm re I read the New Testament in Greek, uh, and then um, read it in English. Uh, and um, then later, when Jan and I have breakfast together, we will have devotions with each other, uh, and we use a book that features a hymn each day, a classic hymn, and we read the hymn and then read the meditation on that hymn. And several of these hymns are of Norwegian provenance, interestingly enough. Uh, and so those are some of the things that we do in our devotional lives. Wow, that's wonderful. And, and great that you can share that with your wife, Jen, as well. Okay, so over to a, a perhaps more academic or more um, uh, another kind of issue. Uh, and, and there is a question that we received. We have asked the Norwegian people to give us a question that we can ask you, and they, they have uh, given us these, these questions. And um, one asks, how can we influence a person that lives in the pursuit of happiness? Isn't it more effective with personal testimonies, with examples of a change in lifestyle, rather than logic and arguments? What, what would you respond to that? Well, John, you might be surprised to hear me say that I think that, yes, sharing a personal testimony and a changed life is far more effective than logic and arguments. Uh, people uh, want to hear from you personally what your faith means to you. How has Christ changed your life? And so I think every Christian needs to have memorized a personal testimony of about, say, three minutes in length that he can share with an unbeliever that will explain what his life was like before he became a Christian, how he became a Christian, and then what change or difference has that made in his life after that. And I think that personal testimony is probably the most effective evangelistic tool that you will have. Now, the point that needs to be made, of course, is that that is not incompatible with giving arguments and evidence for what you believe. They're, they're hand in glove. And so, for example, in many of my debates, you'll notice that I'll first present the logic and the arguments for Christianity, and then I will end with a word of personal testimony that is more uh, intimate and personal and emotional to try to reach out to people and touch them in that way. So I think we can and should do both. Brilliant. Thank you. Okay, so uh, we uh, just stepped out of the Easter break, uh, and uh, we celebrated the resurrection of Jesus. So I think it's timely with a, a question connected to the resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth. And uh, someone says uh, that when arguing for the resurrection, some apologists bring up that disciples were dishonored, arrested, tortured, and killed for the proclamation of the resurrected Christ. But in Acts, we don't read about the death of so many disciples. Is this argument any good? And if so, what is the historical basis for claiming that the disciples were martyred for what they believed in? I don't use this argument very much because, frankly, it is aimed at an obsolete theory that no one defends anymore. 
This um, is aimed at the old conspiracy hypothesis of 17th and 18th century deists who said that the disciples conspired together to steal the body of Jesus and then lie about the resurrection appearances. And ever since, oh, David Strauss's Life of Jesus in 1835, this conspiracy hypothesis has been dead as a doornail. And so it isn't even worth refutation anymore. Nobody believes that the disciples conspired to steal the body and lie about the resurrection appearances. So the the question you ask, in a sense, is merely academic. Uh, to di- answer the question more directly, I think we have abundant evidence in the pages of the New Testament itself that the disciples were willing to die for the truth of what they proclaimed, and that some of them, in fact, did die. Think of James, the son of Alphaeus, or Stephen. The Apostle Paul says in his letters that he was responsible for breaking into the homes of Christian families and hauling them off to jail and even execution. So it's very clear, I think, that the earliest Christians were part of a movement that sincerely believed uh, the truth of what they proclaimed. Now, in terms of what eventually happened to the 12 disciples, Although this isn't an area I've studied myself, my colleague Sean McDowell wrote his doctoral dissertation on this subject and has published this book, The Death, uh, or The Fate, rather, The Fate of the Apostles, in which he weighs the historical traditions concerning what happened to the original apostles, uh, which ones were in fact martyred, and uh, which of these stories are merely legendary. So if anyone should be interested in that, take a look at uh, Sean McDowell's book, The Fate of the Apostles. Well, thank you for that. That's a good book recommendation. Um, Over to another subject, uh, which is the divine command theory uh, and also the the, the Canaanite slaughter where someone would uh, uh, put it in a category. Uh, and, And the question is, is this. It says that when talking about how God ended the lives of the Canaanites, it seems as though your divine command theory implies that God isn't obligated by his own moral duties, since he doesn't issue commands to himself. The Israeli soldiers were unable to end the Canaanite lives themselves, but were obligatory for them under the virtue of God's command to carry out the judgment. Does this imply that God isn't a moral agent since he is not obliged to follow his commands? Which other reasons are we given to follow God's command other than he is God, therefore we should follow him? How how would you respond to that? First, I would attempt to finesse the question a little bit better. It's misstated. The point isn't that God is not obligated by his own moral duties. Rather, the point is that God doesn't have any moral duties to obey. He has no moral prohibitions or obligations. But as a perfectly good being, he acts consistently in accordance with his perfectly just and loving character. So in answer to your question, I would say that God's not having moral obligations and prohibitions does not imply he is not a moral agent. I don't see that having um, the um, responsibility to obey moral commands is what makes a person a moral agent. God is a moral agent in virtue of his perfectly good moral character and his ability to make Um, choices. He has freedom of the will. Um, So I I just don't think that um, the uh, having of moral obligations is essential to being a moral agent. Now, as for the other question, uh, what other reasons are we given to follow God's commands than he is God, therefore we should obey him? I don't think there is any other reason to obey God's commands than that. The the theory is that our moral duties are constituted by divine imperatives, imperatives issued by a competent authority 
gives rise to obligations. And we have these duties in virtue of the fact that God, the supreme good, has issued certain imperatives to us. You shall do this, you shall not do that, and therefore these constitute our moral obligations and prohibitions. Now, of course, it can be added that doing so is very wise. I, I do believe that obeying God's uh, commands will ultimately lead to human flourishing and happiness, but those practical consequences are just the icing on the cake. They aren't the reason that we are obligated to do the th these things. The reason arises from the fact that a competent authority has issued these imperatives to us. Thank you. So a question on the topic of hell. Um, and uh, it goes like this. It seems as though Paul never talks about hell as being an eternal conscious torment. Rather, it seems as though he speaks of hell as being something finite. If hell is an eternal conscious torment, why isn't Paul more clear on this? And why is Jesus speaking about the eternal destruction in Gehenna? I reckon mm -hmm. referring to, to Matthew 10, 28. Yeah, I don't think there's any passage where Paul speaks of hell as being something finite. I, I'm puzzled by that question. Uh, maybe someone can provide a verse for me but I, I can't think of any place that Paul says that the punishment in hell will be finite. In 2 Thessalonians 1.9, Paul says of those who oppose the gospel that they will suffer the penalty of eternal destruction and exclusion from the presence of the Lord. Um, so although he doesn't mention torment there, he does mention that this will be an eternal punishment visited upon the ungodly. As to why he isn't more clear, I suppose it would just be that the topic didn't come up in his letters. We have to remember that the letters of Paul are what are called accidental epistles. That is to say, they are occasioned by certain situations in the churches to which he wrote. Uh, and so they are um, accidental in that sense that they address their needs and concerns. So to give an illustration, if there had not been people in Corinth who were getting drunk at the Lord's Supper, we would have no mention in Paul's epistles of the Lord's Supper. And there would undoubtedly be then New Testament scholars who would say, aha, this proves that the Pauline churches did not celebrate the Lord's Supper. Uh, but because in Corinth they were abusing the Lord's table, Paul wrote about it to them, and so we know about it. Uh, and so I, I, I would say that Paul doesn't address this uh, at greater length simply because it wasn't an issue he faced. As for Jesus, uh, in Matthew 25, in the parable about the sheep and the goats, and how the king separates the sheep on the right hand and the goats on the left hand, he says that the sheep go away into eternal life, but the goats go into eternal punishment. And the word there for eternal in both cases is the same word. So I think that Jesus also believed in and taught the eternal punishment of the wicked. In this question, it seems as though you were quoting um, the 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 verse in Second Thessalonians with the eternal destruction, right? That yes. might perhaps be one of the uh, examples that they would think that Paul is speaking of hell as, as something finite, as the word of destruction. Ah, okay. Now that's a little bit different, John. What you're talking there about is annihilationism. And this would be the idea that God annihilates the damned rather than gives them finite punishment. I took you to mean that the damned would be punished after life for a finite amount of time, and then perhaps they would be released into heaven. It would be like a sort of purgatory, uh, something of that sort. But annihilationism would be a quite different view, um, and you would need to appeal to verses like the ones I mentioned there that 
I, I don't think eternal destruction means uh, that they are annihilated. Um, uh, they will suffer this eternal exclusion from the presence of the Lord. Right, right. So, so the arguments for anni uh, annihilationism hasn't, hasn't convinced you uh, in biblical? Well, I think the problem with annihilationists uh, is that they assume that death and destruction means non-existence. And it seems to me that that's not right at all. Um, life, uh, in the biblical spiritual sense of the word, soe, means spiritual life um, with God. And that's different from mere biological life, bios, from which we get the word biology. So while the wicked in hell may have bios, they have life, they're alive as organisms, they don't have tsoe, they don't have spiritual life because they're separated from God. And so we shouldn't associate death with non-existence. Okay, thank you. So another question, uh, someone writes and says, Hi, Dr. Craig, thanks for the debate with Keith Parsons in the 90s. <laughs> do, do you remember that debate? Oh, very well. That was one of the most robustious debates I've ever been in. Keith Parsons, when he showed up at the debate, had a big floppy brimmed hat and a big cigar. And he said, I'm going to go out and smoke this stogie in the church parking lot after the debate. <laughs> well, that's something you won't forget. <laughs> no. Was there like a controversy with uh, the hallucination uh, going on in that debate? Do I remember that correctly? Did you discuss the hallucination theory in that debate? Uh, yes, that was a funny exchange. Parson said, if God were to appear to me as a giant figure saying, I exist and you should believe in me, I would believe. And I said to him, you would not, Keith. You'd say, wow, did I have a whopper of a hallucination last night? And the whole audience laughed because it was so obvious that's exactly what he would do. Brilliant. That's brilliant. It's fun when you can, when you can uh, uh, have that sort of exchange in the formal debate. Uh, yeah. So, but his question is, what are your views on miracles today? Do they happen? And have you witnessed any that you have found convincing? Mm -hmm. I don't know that I have ever personally witnessed a miracle. Um, I may have once, uh, I was listening to Dr. Ralph Alexander speak at a conference, and he began to lose his voice, and the laryngitis became so bad, he couldn't even talk. I mean, it was just a whisper. He, he couldn't speak, and he just bowed his head at that point and said, Lord, help me. And then he continued to speak, and as he did so, his voice got louder and louder and louder until the end of his talk, it was perfectly normal. And I was looking around at the other people in the audience and I said, why isn't anybody shocked or amazed? It, just, it looks like a miracle. We've just all witnessed a miracle. It was just unbelievable. But, but that would be the closest uh, I've ever come. Uh, but I certainly think that God does miracles today, uh, but by the very nature of the case, I think they tend to be unusual, and uh, so I am not one of those people who craves the miraculous and needs them in order to sustain his faith. Um, I, I, I'm just not very interested in that. All right, okay. Um... So, but uh, a place where everyone will be uh, healed, at least, heaven. Um, Amen. <laughs> there is a question about, hev uh, about heaven, uh, and the question is, do we have free will in heaven? Is it possible that we do have free will in heaven if we can't commit any sin there? I'm inclined to think, John, that we do not have free will to sin in heaven. I think when we go to heaven, the vision of Christ in all his glory and majesty and loveliness will be so overwhelming that the freedom to sin will be effectively removed. The analogy that I like to use to this is to imagine a giant electromagnet 
with iron filings stuck to it, given the power of this electromagnet, it is impossible for the iron filings not to be attached to it because it is so attractive that they cannot resist. And I suspect that it will be like that in heaven for us. Uh, so that although we might have free will to do this or do that, I don't think there will be free will to sin in heaven. Now, you ask, is it possible that people um, might have free will in, in heaven but never sin? Well, I think it's possible. Um, I could imagine a middle knowledge perspective on this where you might say that God only permitted those people to be saved who he knew would freely never sin if they were in heaven. Uh, and so by his middle knowledge, he has selected the elect in such a way that they are only people who always freely do the right thing in heaven. But while that's possible, I don't find that to be a particularly plausible solution. But, but in theory, that the middle knowledge or Molinism could be applied to this, this question as well. Yeah. 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 Right. Um, okay, so the next question is um, asked by a, a young apologist called Amun, uh, a friend of mine, and he uh, asks, what would your advice to young apologists be? Let me gear this toward young Norwegian apologists. I would suggest, first and foremost, you need to master the English language. Don't just speak conversational English. You need to really master it. And the reason for that, John, is that the resources that are available in English are so massive that they just dwarf anything that you could find in Norwegian or, or even in German. And so if you're going to be an apologist, you've got to have access to this great literature that is available in the English language. Second thing I would suggest is to have a study of uh, the basic rules of logic. There are only about nine basic rules of logic that govern inferential reasoning, and you need to master these so that you can formulate your own arguments logically so that they are valid, but then also to detect logical fallacies in the objections of your opponents. So to master basic logic, I would say, is essential. The uh, third thing I would suggest is to have a very good knowledge of Bible contents. Um, even if you're going into, say, philosophical apologetics or scientific apologetics, as a Christian, you need to have a really good grasp of New Testament contents and Old Testament contents. So you need to be familiar with your Bible. And then I suppose the last thing I would say is that you need to have a strong knowledge of historic Christian doctrine. You need to understand things like the doctrine of the Trinity, the attributes of God, um, the incarnation and two natures of Christ, and so forth. It's really critical if you're going to be defending the Christian faith that you have a solid grasp of its theology. So that's a tall order, uh, doing all of those things. It will take years and years of preparation, but I think the person who's serious about serving the Lord in this field um, needs to be serious about putting in those years of preparation. And if someone is, is uh, in the beginning of trying to dig in, dig deeper into the apologetic themes, what would you what would be your recommendation for, for reading? Obviously on God for Student is it's now in Norwegian, but um, but there might be some other helpful resources as well that you would yeah. like to point to. Well I think to begin at the very beginner's level, something like on guard, and then after you've mastered the materials in that, and notice I say mastered, it's not enough just to read it. You need to master it so that you can present the arguments from memory and respond to objections when you hear them. But after you've mastered the contents of that book, 
then you might move to a higher stage, which would be my book, Reasonable Faith, and master the contents of that book. And then beyond that, there are many resources, uh, such as J.P. Moreland and my book, Philosophical Foundations for a Christian Worldview, uh, or the Blackwell Companion to Natural Theology. Uh, many very good books on uh Christian philosophy and um, historical Jesus studies. That's good. I, I sometimes speak to people who find the apologetics to be so massive. They don't know where to start. They, they find it so massive that they, yeah. they stop even before they begin looking into the resources. Um, what would you, uh, what would your advice be to, to the people who found, found, the apologetic resources to be so massive. Yeah, well, again, I, I would just repeat what I've said, John. Start with On Guard. This is a primer. It's kind of like a Swiss army knife. You know, it's got all the little tools in it that you're going to need to present a case for the existence of God, to rebut the main objections to God's existence, and then to give a case for the historical Jesus and his resurrection from the dead. So it really gives you that basic ground level apologetic for the Christian faith. And then it will simply be a matter of deepening your understanding of those arguments by graduating to more difficult books like Reasonable Faith. And obviously people are probably uh, shaped by the needs around them. I, uh, when I, whenever I picked the subject, digging deeper in my theology, uh, I, I listened to people around me and listening to what questions they had and then tried to do something about that. So perhaps listening to people's uh -huh. needs good. as well, uh, uh, that, that might be something good. Sure. I think it is good to network with other like-minded people so that you can stimulate and encourage one another. That's why we like to encourage people to... Um, start a reasonable faith chapter at their university or church where like-minded people can get together to do a book study together or watch a video or a debate and discuss it. Uh, and we will provide resources for anyone who would like to be a reasonable faith chapter director in their local area. So uh, the next question is, what objection to the Christian faith have you felt has been the most, most forceful well, this might surprise you, John, but I think that the most powerful objection I ever heard was the objection to the existence of God based upon Platonism. Platonism is the philosophical doctrine that there exist uncreated abstract objects, things like numbers and sets and other mathematical entities. And these objects are thought to be necessary in their existence, to be eternal, and to be uncreated. And there are infinities of infinities of infinities of these. And these are all independent of God, according to Platonism. So it fact turns out that on Platonism, God is not the sole ultimate reality. He is just an infinitesimal part of reality, most of which exists quite independent of him. Uh, and the arguments for Platonism are such that a great many contemporary philosophers are Platonists. They believe in the reality of these mathematical and abstract objects. And so for 13 years, I made this the full-time object of my study with a view toward finding the most plausible theistic response to the challenge posed by Platonism to uh, God's being the sole ultimate reality. What, were you, what was your response to that in, in short? My response, in a nutshell, is that I do not believe that such entities exist. I think there are a number of what are called anti-realist views of these abstract objects, which are plausible. And there's a whole cornucopia of these anti-realist positions. And I think that it is very plausible that anti-realism is the correct view of these abstract objects. And in that case, 
uh, they don't exist. There are no objects independent of God, which are uncreated by him. Everything that exists has, in fact, been created by God. Yeah, that's that's very interesting. And you you said that you uh, that I might be uh, surprised by your answer to this, and, and you were correct. I was thinking more of the lines of uh, the the divine hiddenness objection or the, the objection from from evil, which is probably though yeah. those objections that you get that you receive the most, perhaps. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Uh, but I remember when I first heard this objection at a philosophy conference in 1982. It hit me like a dagger in the heart because I had no answer for it. And yet it seemed uh, to completely pull the carpet out from underneath theism. Um, and, and so this for me was the most powerful objection to the existence of God I'd ever encountered, even though very few people are troubled by it. To your, uh, to your belief, to your faith life, when you uh, listen to uh, an objection like that? Ah, one of the things you learn, John, when you're a philosopher, this is a really important point, is that there are at least two sides to every question, and usually many, many more. And so when you encounter an objection you don't know the answer to, you don't despair and feel that your faith has suddenly been shattered and the ground has been removed, instead you think, wow, that's a really powerful argument. I, I, I wonder how one might best respond to that. What are some of the alternatives to this? And then you can begin to explore it in a calm and dispassionate way. It's so different from the way the layperson responds to doubt uh, or unanswered questions, which is often just utter despair and uh, and even being on the verge of abandoning his faith. Uh, once you realize how complex these philosophical issues are, uh, you realize that it's probably pretty unlikely that you have heard a knockdown argument against the existence of God. And even though there are perhaps a few things that on the, on the surface is hard to um, make sense in the Christian faith, Leaving Christian faith isn't going into a neutral zone, right? It's, it's embracing another worldview that might have much more uh, difficult things to, to logically... Yeah, oh, that's right. I, I'm glad you mentioned that because here is an argument against the existence of God uh, by, posed by Platonism. But what I didn't mention is on the other side of the scales are all of the arguments for the existence of God, the cosmological argument, the fine-tuning argument, the argument from the applicability of mathematics, the moral argument, the ontological argument. And one can say, gee, even though I don't have an answer to Platonism, I'm confident that God exists because I've got all of this good evidence that God does exist. And that just again shows how having a mastery and understanding of these arguments can help to sustain your faith in times of doubt. It's very helpful. Okay, so the next question is, um, what topic isn't spoken enough about in apologetic circles? What should we, what should we speak more of? Mm -hmm. Well, I think one of the unexplored areas that needs more intention would be the interaction of the brain with theology. Uh, there are all kinds of interesting questions that arise from the study of modern neurology, brain sciences. But unfortunately, it's very difficult to be someone who is trained in neurology and yet also trained in philosophy. But I do think we need people in this area, the philosophy of neurology, who can speak to things like the interaction of the soul and the brain, the problem of free will and determinism, and things of that sort. That's very interesting. So the, the, the last question that we have is, is you obviously uh, participate in a number of debates and, uh, and uh, lectures. How do, you, how do you prepare for them? What do you do uh, to prepare for them? Uh -huh. I believe that the key to successful debating is preparation. 
you want to go into that debate vastly over prepared. So what I do in advance is I not only prepare my own case with its substantiating arguments, but I also study my opponent's writings. I watch any videos of his that are available, and then I make a catalog of his main arguments for his view and his main objections to my view. And then I prepare what I call briefs, which are kind of like the briefs that a lawyer might use, uh, which are my answers to these anticipated points that the opponent might raise. And I will typically try to have two or three responses to every point that he might bring up. And so I lay these out in front of me on the table when I'm in a debate. And then when he brings up an argument, I just pull the brief. And then he brings up another argument. I pull that brief and put it in the stack. Then he brings up another argument. I pull the brief for that. And then I speak from those briefs. And as I say, I'm typically vastly overprepared for these debates. Most of the briefs are never used. They just sit in the file uh, unused. But I've got briefs on everything that does come up, uh, and that enables me to respond effectively to my opponent. The goal in debating should be to never have to think on your feet. You want to be so prepared that you don't have to think on your feet, but just to give the prepared responses that you have uh, done in advance. So it doesn't happen quite often that people caught you off guard and... You're not. You're yeah. surprised by that. Yeah, it's happened a couple of times, but not often. Well, it has been brilliant having you on, uh, Dr. William and Craig. It's it's been a pleasure, and uh, we sure hope that people will uh, buy the book and read it, and not only read it but also master uh, the content of it and use it for the glory of yeah. God and in evangelization with uh, people around them, and also for for their own faith. I think that they that uh, to master the content will strengthen people's faith as it has strength in mind. So uh, thank you for, for being here. And hopefully we'll get to see you in Norway sometime soon as well. I would enjoy that very much. But thank you for this uh, chance to do a remote interview.